We're seated in the apartment of uh, Mrs. Hansberry. I believe this is the apartment of the mother or the sister of Lorraine Hansberry, whom we can rightfully describe as a distinguished young American playwright. This may sound like a strange thing to say. An artist has written one play, and we call her a distinguished American playwright. But it isn't one man's opinion, the winner of the Drama Critics Circle Award, which in itself may be unprecedented. I'm not sure. I'll ask Miss Hansberry about this. Lorraine Hansberry, originally of Chicago. Very much so. Back home for a week or so, visiting your family. Mm -hmm. Until Sunday. If we could sort of make this a rambling, a rambling kind of conversation and, and dig as much as we can out of you, your thoughts, how you came to write it, and your feelings about the play and, and theater generally. This afternoon, you, you gave what everybody that I felt was an inspiring, not a speech, an inspiring piece of conversation at Roosevelt University about drama generally. And if we can touch on that as we go along, why fine. I sc uh, Lorraine, mm -hmm. I, may I? Sure. I'm a going question to call you studs. <laughs> <laughs> a question is often, I'm sure, is asked you many times. You may be tired of it. Someone comes up to you and says, this is not really a Negro play, Raisin in the Sun. I'm sure you've been told this many... What's your reaction? They say, this mm. is a play about anybody. Now, what do you say? Well, that's an excellent question. Uh, because invariably, this has been the point of reference. People are trying, what they, I know what they're trying to say, what they're trying to say, and mistakenly as a matter of fact, which I'll speak about, what they're trying to say is that this is not what they consider the traditional treatment of the Negro in the theater. They're trying to say that it isn't a propaganda play, that it isn't a protest no play, play, and that it isn't something that hits you over the head and the other remarks which have become cliches themselves mm -hmm. as a matter of fact in discussing this kind of material. So what they're trying to say is something very good. Uh, they're trying to say that they believe that uh, the characters in our play transcend category. However, it's an unfortunate way to try and do it because I believe that one of the most sound ideas in dramatic writing is that in order to create the universal, you must pay very great attention to the specific. In other words, I've told people that not only is this a Negro family, specifically and definitely culturally, but it's not even a New York family <laughs> or a Southern Negro family. It is specifically Southside South Chicago. Uh, that kind of care, that kind of attention to the detail of reference and so forth. In other words, I think people will, ex to the extent they accept them and believe them as wh who they're supposed to be, to that extent they can become everybody. So I was, it's definitely a Negro play before it's anything else. The universality itself is italicized when you say something specific about a specific human being or a group of human beings, as you did here. Uni universality, I think, emerges from truthful identity of what is. Something you said as you were... Uh, breaking down this cliche, this well-meant, this mm. well-meant uh, yes. point that uh, these are well-rounded people, they meant could be anybody. But you say, when people who say that, forget that, you wrote this play. <laughs> you wrote this play for a certain yes. reason, yes. too. You wrote, not a certain reason, shall I say, a certain need to write this play. How did you come about? Uh, this is a yeah, rather Before big, I say that, though, sure. I just want to say the other part that I said I would refer to, sure. which is that... Uh, I don't know what everybody's talking about when they talk about drama in American theater that has been hitting them over the head on the Negro question. They keep alluding to some mysterious mm. whoop, a body of material which allegedly did this. I, for one, can't recall that we have had anything approaching uh, a great number of protest plays or so-called social plays about Negroes. And as a matter of fact, the last play on Broadway that was a Negro play dealt with a boy coming into adolescence. In other words, it seems to Take me that... Take a giant step. Yes. You know, where the, the, the Negro question as such was not uh, a paramount issue at all. Uh, it seems to me there's a preoccupation and a sense of guilt or something that some, that some elements are so afraid of what they feel that they're already anticipating something that hasn't been true. This is a very interesting comment <laughs> here. Uh, 
We need a few protest us. plays, as a matter of fact. In fact, the last <laughs> protest play as such, with a capital P, I think, mean, was something called Stevedore, which was years and mm. years ago, as I remember. The 30s. One of the very few, really. Uh, now, take a giant 30s. step. Uh, now, I suppose somebody might have said of Louis Peterson's play, oh, this could be, or oh, could they have said it about that, as they did of your play? And also, the one play of which this description is true, as a matter of fact, was Deeper the Roots, which happens to roots. have been a quite a good yeah. play. It wasn't, it wasn't a sloppy play. I would treat all dramatic material differently myself, but that's irrelevant. In terms of ordinary Broadway fare, it was as good as any other play. What they're sensitive about is, is the material that's used in it, obviously. I'm thinking of Walter Lee Younger. You call him the, the focal character, the protagonist of the play, Walter Lee Younger. And for those, the great many listeners who were not fortunate to hear you this afternoon at Roosevelt, you spoke of Walter Lee Younger as an affirmative hero. And in contrast to many of the heroes of theater, such as we see today, of very excellent plays. Would you mind uh, explain that a bit? Well, as I went on at length about it this afternoon because, uh, you know, I wanted to develop it in terms of what I think are some general patterns in contemporary drama. But specifically, in terms of the play itself, Walter is affirmative because he refuses to give up. There are moments when he doubts, you know, himself, and uh, even retreats and goes back into something that Obviously, to the extent that the point of view of the artist, the, the author, is clear in this play that I don't agree with and things that he decides to do. But in the end... You mean investing in the dough, you mean? Mm, well, beyond that point when he says not only was he cheated, but the solution is to go out and cheat everybody else. Oh, yeah, that's because right. Because this, this is the way life is. What he means, of course, is that this is the way the life around him is. Uh, but I suppose thematically what... What he represents is my own feeling that sooner or later we are going to have to make principled decisions in America about a lot of things. And uh, any number of these decisions are going to seem contrary to things that we think we want. In other words, we've set up some very materialistic and uh, overtly uh, uh, we think solid values? Uh, yes, overtly um, limited concepts of how the world should go. Sooner or later, I think we're going to have to decide on them. In other words, I think it's just as conceivable to uh, create a character today who decides maybe that uh, his whole life is wrong so that he ought to go do something else altogether. And really make a completely, a complete reversal of things that we think are very acceptable. This to me is a certain kind of affirmation. It isn't just rebellion, because rebe rebellion rarely knows what you know what it wants to do when it gets through rebelling. Even this affirmation against it's a what little revolutionary. No, what may be considered accepted values generally conventional values, let's say, within a framework. In yes, yes. Walter Lee does. Yes. As uh, you say, nothing is solved, nothing completely solved in the play as they move to a new neighborhood. Right. Uh, you know, it would be just as well, though, to say that um, I chose Willie Loman. I chose Willie Loman because I was making a point. But there was another affirmative character to emerge in the last 80 years, who, interestingly enough, also chose death, and who was affirmative rather than negative. And this was John Proctor in The Crucible. In The Crucible. Uh, in other words, the point becomes, what did he choose death for? He chose death for life. <laughs> in this case, you know, this is the uh, story that well, involves a man who stands up against the Salem witch hunts in the 17th century. This is choosing death for a reason that's going to substantiate life. For going life to make it as bigger. a man rather than as a cipher. Exactly. Mm. John uh, Proctor. I hadn't thought about the... This is remarkable. Because Walter Lee Younger may have physical trouble as he leaves, you see. Uh, as John he Proctor He probably did, yeah. will. <laughs> but Walter Lee Younger... If he's moving anywhere <laughs> in Chicago. 
found himself as a man, as John, as John Proctor. I hadn't thought about this. I think of now Mrs. Younger, that is Mrs. Big Walter Younger, Walter Lee's mother. Uh, here is a remarkably strong person. Question I'm going to ask, he's probably been asked many times. In many cultures, the mother, the woman, is very strong. Mm -hmm. Now, ta uh, ta uh, Steinbeck used it with Mrs. Jode. Yes. In Greeks of Wrath. Yes, someone now, drew a in, beautiful analogy. In Negro families, uh, through the years, the mother has always been a sort of pillar of strength, hasn't she? Yes, yes. Those of us who are, to any degree, students of Negro history think this has something to do with the slave society, of course, where she was allowed to a certain degree of, uh, not ascendancy, but of at least control of her family, whereas the male was relegated to absolutely noth nothing at all. And this has probably been sustained by the sharecropper system in the South and on up into even urban Negro life in the North. At least that's the theory. I think it's a mistake to get it confused with Freudian concepts of uh, matriarchal dominance and Philip Wiley's momism and all that business. It, it's not the same thing. Uh, not that there aren't negative things about it, not that tyranny sometimes doesn't emerge, you know, uh, as a part of it. But basically, it's, uh, it's a great thing. Uh, these women have become the backbone of our people in a very necessary way. Underground this, railway leaders. Yes, yes. Uh, the Irish reflect this, I think. There's a, there's a relationship between uh, Mother Younger in this play and Juno, which is very strong and obvious. And I think there's always a relationship, perhaps I don't know that much about Irish history, but there was probably a necessity why among oppressed peoples the mother will assume a certain kind of uh, role. In the way she's almost, it's not it's the wrong word I'm using, it's almost a front. Not really a front, but uh, the guy, you know, immediately the guy of any uh, people under pressure is the prime target to begin with, maybe. I don't know. Possibly. This, this, this has an element in it. Obviously, uh, people who are sophisticated enough to know it say that obviously the, the most oppressed group of any oppressed group will be its women, you know, obviously, since women, period, are oppressed in society. And if you've got an oppressed group, they're twice oppressed. Mm -hmm. So I should imagine that um, they react accordingly as oppression makes people more militant and so forth and so on than twice militant because they're twice oppressed so that there's a, an assumption of leadership historically. I want, to, I want to come back to Mrs. Younger later on, but you mentioned the Juno, so there's something you said in the current issue of New Yorker, your feelings about O'Casey. <laughs> yes. O'Casey, the playwright. You were talking yes. about... Some I of love the, Sean O'Casey. What is it about O'Casey? Of course, your play has a certain life to it now. What are you feeling about O'Casey? Well, O'Casey is divided, first of all. When I speak of the O'Casey that I love, I mean things like Shadow of a Gunman and Juno, and um, I've never read The Plow and the Stars, I want to. But this area, and Red Roses for me. Uh, this, to me, is uh, the playwright of the 20th century accepting and using the most obvious instruments of Shakespeare which is the human personality in its totality. Uh, I've always thought this is profoundly significant for Negro writers and uh, to use, not to copy. There's no reason to copy. The material here is too rich to copy anybody. But as a model, as a point of departure, O'Casey never fools you about the Irish, you see. You go, you, the Irish drunkard, the Irish braggart, the Irish... Uh, uh, Liar. Liar, who's always talking about how he's going to fight the revolution and when the English really show up, you know, he mm -hmm. runs and gets under the bed and the young girl goes out to uh, fight with the, with the Tommies, you see, and so forth and so on. And the genuine heroism which must naturally emerge when you tell the truth about people. This, this to me, is the height of uh, artistic perception and is the most... Um, a rewarding kind of thing that can happen in drama because when you 
when you believe people so completely, you know, that uh, they're so recognizable, because everybody has their drunkards and their braggarts and their cowards, then you also believe them in their moments of heroic Heroism assertion. Too. You know, you don't doubt them. You don't feel like, well, this is soap opera. Now, Walter Lee, uh, uh, what, uh, what you said can be directly applied to your own work, really, because you showed Walter Lee's frailties throughout. You know, and when he did emerge in that heroic moment, we believed. You know. well, that was the hope. That was the intent. Also, the, the other thing about O'Casey is that, in other words, what I believe in, for instance, if we're really going to talk technical dramaturgy, is what I do not believe in is naturalism. I think naturalism should die away and a quiet death. I do believe in realism. By naturalism, you mean the tape-recorded kind of... Precisely, that this is if not art. If I say Chayefsky, in a way. Not because... Uh, the, the only reason I say that because I'm talking about yeah. it negatively at the yeah. moment, and there are things about Chayefsky which I think have been very important for American television drama. Uh, but naturalism is its own limitation, you know. In other words, if you just repeat what is, you can go and show a murder and say this is the whole of life because after all there it is you've made a photographic reproduction of it go deny it it's true it's real realism demands the imposition of a point of view and the point of view of O'Casey is always the wonder of the nobility of people and he literally imposes it on us uh, it's the additional dimension always of the humanity of people and he literally imposes it on us. And he uses something which I can't imitate because I'm not equipped to. He uses uh, poetic dialogue, which moves it out of the realm of what I'm able to write into the sphere of great art. I wish I could. I think, as a matter of fact, there are parallels between Negro speech, even urban Negro speech in America, and... and um, urban Irish speech, which should make it very easy. But there it is doesn't great, happen. <laughs> there is a great deal of poetry. I felt I'm not, I'm not buttering you now. Well, I'm There glad is a to great deal it. of poetry in, in Raisin in the Sun. Because to me, you can, again, not naturalism, you say, but not realism as such, but larger than life. Isn't that what you meant to say? Theater should be larger than life? Always. Always. There used to be a ballet in this play. <laughs> There was a ballet? There used to be a ballet. I had a letter from Max Lerner. I don't know if that means anything. The Chicago list. Yes, it does. I think there are many Max Lerner <laughs> readers here. And he said to me that... Oh, excuse me. He, I rather, he, he wrote a column on the, on the play, you know. And he, in, the in the New York column, Post. In the New York Post. And he said uh, it was a very good column. And uh, he said that uh, he liked the play very much. However, it was a little too literal for his taste. And those places where Miss Hansberry almost let go her imagination, she suddenly remembered that... She was a nice, proper girl, and then got back to this very literal play, you see. Uh, he was very much enamored of the African scene, for instance, you know, Walter gets up, which so forth uh, is... Walter is, does the warrior, that one where he... Where he yes, and where he off. speaks in mm -hmm. open poet, mm -hmm. poetic uh, declarations about the coming time when we're going to march and so forth and so on, which is a half of the man which only realism could impose on the scene, not naturalism, because naturalism would never happen. Nobody would believe it. And I wrote him a note, and I said, You're, that was a very interesting remark, because I was the one who was tamed, you know. I, I think that uh, imagination has no bounds in a realism, that you can do anything, which is permissible in terms of the truth of the characters, and that's all. That's all that you have to care about. And that I told him that there had once been a ballet, a modern ballet in this play. You <laughs> were in it as you, when line. you originally wrote this. That's right. So when, the, when the motifs of the characters were to be done in modern dance, it didn't work. <laughs> it may not have worked at it that time, but work. the fact is no. that, that you had a ballet in mind indicates that there was a poetic feeling, you see. Uh, right. It, it indicates some of the directions that I feel I would There's go. There's something you said a moment ago, and uh, I know Bill Leonard of, of the trip interviewed you briefly this afternoon. I mean, you, uh, the play, some will ask you, is this autobiographical? Yes, Yet they your, keep asking Yet your that. background is not... Your background culturally may be the place, to some extent background, but it is not specifically. No, it isn't. I've tried to explain this to people. I've come from an extremely comfortable background, materially speaking, and 
uh, yet uh, I've also tried to explain we live in a ghetto, you know, which automatically means intimacy with all classes and all kinds of experiences. It's not any more difficult for me to know the people that I wrote about than it is for me to know members of my family because there is that kind of intimacy. This is one of the things that uh, the American experience has meant to Negroes. We are one people. And I also tried to tell the people at The New Yorker, you know, in that interview that you read that uh, I had a reason for choosing this particular class. I guess at this moment the Negro middle class may be from 5 to 6 to 7 percent of our people. The, you know, the comfortable middle class. And I believe that uh, they are atypical of the more uh, representative experience of Negroes in this country. Therefore, I have to believe that whatever we ultimately achieve, however we ultimately transform our lives, will come from the kind of people that I chose to portray. That therefore, they are more pertinent, more relevant, more significant, and most important, most decisive in our political history and uh, our political future. This is here again is the is the mark of a playwright, if I may interject this. Outside your own, it within your experience and yet outside it in the material sense. Yes. Because you sensed here was the more dramatic. Yes. Uh, yes. Figure. The little girl, if I may, uh, I'm going to bring a personal thing. Uh, the very charming and alive little sister. Is this? Slightly autobiographical Oh, she's stages. very autobiographical. My sister, my brother would tell you that. <laughs> this, uh, as a matter of fact, it's an expression of conceit, really, because the truth of the matter is that uh, I enjoyed making fun of this girl, who is myself, eight years ago, you know. I enjoyed making fun of her because I have that kind of confidence about what she represents. I'm not worried about her, you know. Uh, she's precocious, she's over-outspoken, she's everything, you know, which uh, tends to be comic and, uh, you know, people sigh with her and they have one at home <laughs> like that, you know, and they, they enjoy her for this reason. She's very much alive. Yes, but I also uh, feel that she doesn't have a word in the play that I don't agree with still today. I would say it differently today. That's it. She doesn't have a word in the play. You don't. You would say it differently, the more mature way today. I hope it's more mature. But basically, the kid is right. Oh, I think so. Yes. She's uh, she's suspect of many things that Walter Lee accepts. You see, mm -hmm. he has the energy and he has the will at the moment to to make the decisive decisions. That's why I say that he's a pivotal character. As a matter of fact, if I can just digress, people that I've been interested in some of the criticisms of the play, we had. One letter in the New York Times from, or you could tell by the <clears throat> tone and quality of the letter from a very sophisticated young man sitting somewhere, who said that he regarded the soap opera, you know, which amused me. And uh, because if anyone wanted to discuss this play in terms of soap opera, they'd have a great deal of trouble because soap opera implies melodrama, and melodrama has a classical definition. If you can prove that there are no motivated crises in this play, I would be astonished. So I don't think it qualifies as melodrama. I think it's legitimate drama. Um, or a happy ending. If he thinks that's a happy ending, I invite him to come. Well, he's <laughs> welcome. Yeah. Go live in one of those communities where these Trumbull people Park. are going. However, so that that character of uh, criticism I am inclined to be contemptuous of because it's based on a snobbery that doesn't understand things uh, that doesn't understand the profundity of things that are deliberately simple. Lorraine, you, you hit a very tender point with me. I won't go into this on this very uh, on the letter written by that young man. I <laughs> am very well acquainted. With what that. I did want to say though was that I'm not hostile to legitimate criticism. And one of the things that's been very interesting to me is that no one has picked out something that I think is a very genuine criticism of the play. That is that it lacks a central character. In true classical sense, there is no central character in this play. You there is a pivotal character. In Walter Lee. Yes. But he isn't said because some will say, some will tell you Mrs. Young. That's right. That it, people come say. out and they think it's the mother, they think it's the son, and some people are so enamored of the daughter they're not sure that she isn't really more relevant in some way or somehow. Well, this is a this is to me a weakness of the play. Is this really a weakness? I mean, uh, must there? Of course, is it must it be about a single? You see, this is a play in a sense of may, maybe you're right. A play about I'm thinking of, of Wake and Sing for the moment. You see, who was central character in what was a very excellent play of a Jewish 
lower middle class family, mm -hmm. there was no central uh, any more than in yours, really, was there. Well, obviously, when you start breaking rules, yeah. you may be doing it for a yeah. good reason. You may yeah. find something yeah. else. Yeah, and since true. people are able to hold on to the play and become involved yeah. in a way that the central character is supposed to guarantee, then maybe you don't really need it. Yeah. I wonder But if for me, all I'm saying is yeah. that, uh, in my view of drama, the great yeah. plays have always had a central character with whom we rise or fall, no matter what, from the Greeks well, through Shakespeare. Willie uh, or Hamlet. Through or... Ibsen, so... Hmm. The, no, Afri right. the African suitor, you know, I'll come to something now. Mm. This has always intrigued me very much. Remember, my I favorite asked character. Sidney <laughs> Quatre is a remarkable figure. Who is he? What is his uh, meaning in this particular mm. play in contrast to the others? Mm. He represents two things. He represents, first of all, the true intellectual. This is a young man who is so absolutely confident in his understanding and his perception about the world, that he has no need for any of the uh, facade of pseudo-intellectuality, for any of the pretenses and the, you know, the nonsense, which is why he can laugh at her. She's just getting to a point of understanding where he's been already. He's, you know, he can already kid about all the features of intense nationalism because he's been there, and he understands beyond that point. He's already concerned about the human race on a new level. He's a true, genuine intellectual. He's a man who's involved in concepts so that he doesn't have time or interest except for amusement in useless passion and useless uh, promenading of ideas. That's partially what he represents. That's one part of it. The other thing that he represents is much more overt. I was aware that on the Broadway stage they have never seen an African who didn't have his shoes hanging around his neck, you know, and a bone through his nose or his ears or something. The stereotype. And I thought that even just theatrically speaking, this would most certainly be refreshing, you know. And uh, again, it, it required no departure from truth because the only Africans that I have known, of course, have been African students in the United States who, this boy is a composite of many of them, as a matter of fact, no one guy. And what they have represented to me in life is what this fellow represents in the play, excuse me, and that is the emergence of an articulate and deeply conscious uh, colonial intelligentsia yes, <laughs> in the world. Uh, I'm very much concerned and caught up in the movements of the African peoples mm -hmm. toward uh, colonial liberation, liberation out of colonialism. And he represents that to me. He also uh, signifies a, um, you know, a hangover of something that began in the 30s when Negro intellectuals first discovered the African past, became very uh, aware of it. Garveyism and everything else at the time, maybe. Yes, that was part of it in a right. different sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I meant particularly uh, in poetry and uh, the creative oh, arts. Oh, the culture that was there. Yes, Hughes did this and uh, Africa this and Africa that. I still feel this way. I want to reclaim it. The great culture. Not physically, I don't mean I want to but move to it. I think it's, 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 I'm glad you mentioned this. Uh, the, so many anthropologists agree. I mean, the great culture that is there, that has been, and that was uh, stolen, too. Oh, sure, sure and which uh, may very well uh, make very decisive contributions to the development of the world in the next few years. There's a point... I suspect it's going to. <laughs> I'm sure it will. There's a point... Asagai is an angry young man who can be very quiet in his anger. This is the young student. The African student. You say he is an angry young man. Yes, who can There's be a... quiet yeah, in his anger. Quiet. There's a point I want to raise. Now, you may get a kick out of this and disagree. Uh, when Sidney Poitier and Leon Bibb, his friend, the singer, mm -hmm. you know, were interviewed, mm -hmm. they spoke of the young student. They said, he's an idealist. He would have a <coughs> rough time. Now, see if you agree with this. This is a very interesting point. Right? <laughs> they say Nkrumah and Kenyatta are very practical men, is the point they were making. And he, your friend, would uh, have a rough time uh, in the power battle as such. He might be sort with, of hamburger. 
squeezed between two forests. This was the inference. I hope I haven't misinterpreted them. I, I bring the, they were I, saying that, uh, uh, the, that Asagai, the African yeah. suit in the play, as opposed to men like Kenyatta and Nkrumah, that's is right. an idealist yeah, person. That's there. right. Oh, that's they, 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 admire, <laughs> they admire the two men they were talking about. They were saying that he may be just taken. Is the, he, he might be victimized by, in, a, in a rough and tumble battle, being the idealist he is, you see. Except that this man has an ideological preparation for that. In fact, in one sense, he gives the statement of the play. You know, I don't know how many people get it, but he, he does. He says, she says to him, you're always talking about independence and freedom in Africa, but what about the time when that happens and then you'll have crooks and petty thieves who come into the, to power and they'll do the same things, only now they'll be black, you know. So what's the difference? And he says to her that this is virtually irrelevant in terms of history, that uh, when that time comes, there will be... Nigerians to step out of the shadows and kill the tyrants, just as now they must do away with the British. Uh, and that history always solves its own questions, but you get to first things first. In other words, this man has no illusions at all. This is a wonderful answer. This he just believes in the order that things must take. He knows that first, before you can start talking about the, what's wrong with the independence, get it, <laughs> and I'm with him. That's wonderful. You tell that to them when you get back here. <laughs> Again, if I may come back now and be personal, my reactions to the play when it opened here in Chicago is so completely taken, with the direction of Lloyd Richards, mm. incidentally, too. Yes, it's brilliant, and I Of think. course, the cast, but uh, the play's the thing. We come back to that again anew. And the next question, we've sort of talked of Raisin now on you. You have, I imagine, a number of projects in mind. If I don't want to uh, dig here unless you feel free yourself in... What projects you're thinking of tackling? We well, of all things in the world, I have uh, become involved in doing an opera libretto, which I do hesitate to talk about because I'm right. uh, <laughs> it's a just uh, getting into it and terrified of it. I don't know a thing in the world about writing an opera, uh, but I'm going to do one with a young Negro composer in New York who. I think he's enormously talented and uh, imaginative in his music. We'll let that rest for a moment, and we'll see it. Let's see, we'll see it. <laughs> but since you mentioned opera, there was uh, perhaps you you were misquoted, or I want to get the New York Times quoted you. You you you, you spoke of a certain irritation in seeing plays, so-called uh, plays about the Negro or such, written by people wholly re uh, removed yes, from the situation. Yes. Yes. What was the cracking? Was one of wonderful one by Carmen Jones? Something you said about it that was very funny. Well, there's, you know, the, yeah. I probably alluded to the fact that I've been struck that uh, the the whole concept of the exotic, you know, that in Europe they think that the, well, the gypsy is just the most exotic thing that ever walked across the earth. This is because he's isolated from the mainstream of European life. So that obviously the natural parallel in American life is the Negro. <laughs> You know, very exotic. Exciting. So whenever they get ready to do something like uh, a Bizet opera, which involves the gypsies of Spain, uh, it's translated, they think, very neatly into a Negro piece. And uh, I just think this is sort of a bore by now. That this is, uh, it's very fine music, but, you know. Uh, the cliches are there. I'm, I'm, I'm bored with the cliches. It's pretty worrisome by now. I don't think very many people realize how boring, aside from being nauseating, that, that uh, stereotype notions are also very dull. I, you know, I think this this said far too, not often enough that uh, it isn't only a matter that Porgy and Bess, I'm talking about the book now because once again this is good music, this is beautiful music. I think this great American music in which the roots of our native opera are to be found someday. But the book, the, the Du Bois Haywood no, book, uh, not only is that offensive, you know, it isn't only that it insults me because it's, it's a degrading concept and a degrading way of looking at people, but it's bad art because it doesn't tell the truth and fiction demands the truth. You know, you have to give a many-sided character. In other words, there is no excuse for stereotype. No, no, I'm not talking 
socially or politically, I'm talking as an artist now. Aesthetically nowadays. Exactly. That if, if someone feels that this is a lie, you know, because it's just one half of me, then the artist should shudder for reasons other than the NAACP, the responsible artist. Something you just said, art must tell the truth. I think so. It's almost the only place where you can tell it. <laughs> what about writing today? Uh, whether it be drama, uh, I'm thinking of uh, more specifically. I'm, I'm big young Negro writers today. I mean, any hit you? I mean, there's John Killen's Young mm. Blood, perhaps. Or... Well, there isn't a great deal happening. Uh, I've just started to read Frank London Brown's book, and I, uh, I'm not equipped to talk about it because I'm I'm just starting to get into it. Um, there's a young guy in New York who's been one of the exiles who's come home. We're starting a new movement against the 30s. Some of the American kids are coming back now from Paris and Rome. Uh, Jimmy Baldwin. Well, know, he'd gone away. Who had got, he, he left. <coughs> he went. He, enough. Did Baldwin do that, too? Baldwin is yeah. who I'm talking about. Oh, oh James Baldwin. James oh, Baldwin, uh, who is back and who I think... I don't read novels that much, I'm ashamed to say, for somebody who wants to write one. But I think from what I've read of his essays and some of his fiction, because this is undoubtedly one of the most talented American writers walking around. And uh, if he can wed uh, his particular gifts, I think which are just way beyond most of us trying to write in many levels to uh, material of substance, then we have the potential of a great American writer. He's one that I think he of. He came back. This is interesting. Mm. I'm thinking, of course, of someone very definite, uh, Richard Wright, of course. Yes, who didn't come back. No. And uh, who has not been just impressive in his output, in my opinion. Would you feel, since you said this, this last thing you just said, do you feel, this may sound like cliche, that I'm saying, away, away from roots, I hate to use the word, and yet Richard Wright, who was so close and strong, no, Go you ahead. know why? Go ahead. Because, and I said this on television in New York recently, this thing of being away from one's roots, I was making a different point. What yeah. I was saying, somebody's, people are always talking about how don't get lost in a cause, you know, because this is what destroys art. And I've been obliged to remind people that for 200 years, the only writers in English literature we've had to have boast about have been the Irish, who come from an oppressed culture, you know, Shaw, O'Casey, Joyce. From from Jonathan Swift to James Joyce and so forth and so on. You name them in, in the last 200 years and they've been Irishmen, which I don't think is an accident, even though they aren't protest writers in the sense that we think of in the United States. Uh, but also, most of them have been writing outside of Ireland. In other words, O'Casey is writing his Dublin plays, you know, in uh, Devonshire in England, and they still ring and have good Irish flavor and then the Irish don't seem to reject them in terms of, you know, being false, so I guess it's good. No, I think there must be some other reason why Wright deteriorated. Well, you've answered my question right there. That's beautiful, <laughs> that's right. What? Uh, I don't know what the reason is because I think he had within him the possibilities to have been the greatest American writer because what he had, I think, would have made William Faulkner uh, seem just peculiar, which of course is what he seems anyhow, in my opinion. Go but ahead, you, you just said, what do you mean by that? Well, I haven't even read that much Faulkner, but uh, I'm not impressed with obscurity. I think it's easier. For all I know, the man could be a genius. For all I know, he might be the reverse. I just can't tell from obscurity. Sooner or later, I have to be able to get some sense of organization and uh, treatment of material that lets me know that there's skill here or genius, you know. And I can't tell this from a, from a Faulkner. Of course, matter from much of James Joyce. But at least his point of departure was one I could understand. Uh, and Wright, of course, belonged to another tradition of American writing. I don't even think it was a conscious belonging, but he did, that, uh, you know, I think came to flower in things like Rapes of Wrath and uh, the novel of that nature. If my husband were here, he'd say Theodore Dreiser, actively. Dreiser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I, I'd like to see 
that kind of uh, panoramic power reemerge in the American novel. I think maybe it may come from a Negro novelist. Someone like Baldwin, who may have been away in his know return. If, you don't know. I don't know if Baldwin's yeah. eyes are that wide. The gifts are there, you know, but... If I his eyes are that wide, that's a beautiful <laughs> phrase. I like that. <laughs> I love that phrase. Well, it's obvious. He feels I'm worried about what he sees. <laughs> you know, that, that gets to be the problem. Well, I think it's obvious that uh, it's no accident that Raisin of the Sun came to be written by Lorraine Hansberry after we've been listening to her now. And I know this is late at night here at home. And if, I wish I'd suggest people read the current issue of The New Yorker. <laughs> and you can find there, too, the, the, the graciousness in, in Miss Hansberry and the tremendous demands. What about success, this little goddess success? What does it do to you? It, it obviously deprives you of privacy to something. Well, right now it does. Yeah, it does. This one moment here. It does, except that it's wonderful. It's wonderful, and uh, I'm enjoying it. I think it's important. I think there comes a time when you, you know, you pull the telephone out and you go off and you, you end it. But for the time being, I'm enjoying every bit of it. I've tried to go to everything I was invited to. I, I shouldn't even say this on the air, but so far I've tried to answer every piece of correspondence I get, which, as I said in the piece, gets to be about 20 and 30 pieces a day at this point. But uh, this, I don't have the right to be very personal about the reception to this play, because I think the reception to this play transcends what I did or what Sidney Poitier or Lloyd Richards or even Philip Rose or any of us connected with it. I think what it reflects at this moment is that at this particular moment in our country, as backward and as depressed as I, for instance, am about so much of it, there's a new mood. I think we went through eight to 10 years of misery under McCarthy and all that nonsense. And uh, to the great credit of the American people, they got rid of it. And they're feeling like, make new sounds. And I'm glad I was here to make one, you know? Beautiful, make new sounds. That's the best of jazz men say that too, but in this case, certainly one of the most sensitive of writers says it. It's a close relationship. <laughs> I've often said that uh, the glory of Langston Hughes was that he, uh, he took the quality of the blues and put it into our poetry. And I think when the Negro dramatist can begin to approach a little of that quality, he might almost get close to what O'Casey does in putting the Irish folk song into play. I'd like to. I think Lorraine Hansberry is on that road, certainly. Thank you very much. And is there anything you, uh, sort of a postscript, always allow us opening, anything else you care to say, anything, it, it doesn't matter, that you haven't said thus far? You mean quickly or a paragraph? <laughs> no, no, as, as much time <laughs> as you want. I can always like. say something. We're I'd say this, that uh, I spoke of, of how I think there's a new affirmative political mood and social mood in our country having to do with the fact that people are finally even getting aware that Negroes are tired and it's time to do something about that question. That, but beyond that, in terms of the total picture, I'd also like to see a parallel to it in terms of the culture of our country. I can see no reason in the world why the American theater should be lined up on about six blocks in Broadway in New York City. I'd like to be see a little agitation to get uh, national theater and other art programs in this country so that the kids all over the United States can go see Shakespeare without thinking it's a bore, you know. Or Lorraine Hansberry <laughs> or <laughs> Eugene O'Neill. That's all. <laughs> well, a double thank you for that, certainly. Lorraine Hansberry and the, uh, you people who have missed the play here during its pre-New York run, go to New York, well, if you can get tickets, fine, but someday it'll return to Chicago. Obviously it will when the National the company, company comes and the original company. Lorraine Hansberry, playwright, human being, thank you very much. That was a conversation that occurred 12 years ago here in Chicago with Lorraine Hansberry, the, the late uh, Miss Hansberry. Uh, it was in conjunction with the opening pre-New York opening of her play, Raisin in the Sun. And in thinking of the conversation, think of 12 years, how much has happened and how little has happened, both. And the references, of course, many references are dated. Don't get the current issue of the New Yorker about Lorraine Hansberry, because that was 1959. But uh, it would seem the theme is still, fortunately and unfortunately, quite contemporary. And though one of the excerpts from the uh, production, the performance of The Young Gifted and Black, it's a it's a collection of various unfinished pieces by Lorraine Hansberry. And Chenille Perry offers this one, Summer, 
And this is really autobiographical, too, because her girlhood was here, summer in Chicago. My childhood South Side summers were the ordinary city kind, full of the street games which other rememberers have turned into fine ballets these days, and rhymes that anticipated what some people insist on calling modern poetry. Oh, Mary Mac, 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 with the silver buttons, 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 all down her back, 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 she asked her mother, 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 for 15 cents, Sense, sense to see the elephant, elephant, elephant jump over the fence, fence, fence. Well, he jumped so high, 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 till he touched the sky, 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 and he didn't come back, back, back till the 4th of July, lie, lie, lie. I remember skinny little south side bodies by the fives and tens of us panting the delicious hours away. May I? And the voice of authority. Yes, you may. You may take one giant step. One drew in all one's breath and tightened one's fist and pulled the small body against the heavens, stretching, straining all the muscles in the legs to make one giant step. It's a long time. One forgets the reason for the game, for children's games are always explicit in their reasons for being. To play is to win something, or not to be it, or to be high pointer, or outdoer, or sometimes just the winner. But after a time, one forgets. Why was it important to take a small step, a teeny step, or the most desired of all, one giant step? A giant step to where? <laughs> 